Oh, here we go. Maybe. Yep, there it is. Got it. This is our 40th lesson on this series. I know it gets long and drawn out, but uh, there are many things we need to cover to be certain that we got this squared away. So we want to look into questions about the flood. More questions continuing from last week's lesson. And uh, <clears throat> one of the claims is, are not there more fossils in the sedimentary rocks than could have lived at one time? Uh, that's one of the claims that's made uh, regarding the sedimentary rocks. And uh, so they claim that there's just too many fossils. Well, we've already laid out <clears throat> that the fertility uh, of the soil and the ocean itself was just much, much, much greater than it is now. And before antediluvian fertility. The amount of oxygen in the available for the antediluvian animals and and uh, was greater, and all of this provided for a a, a, a superabundance of of uh, organisms to be fossilized by the flood. So it greatly enhanced both the size and number of the animals that could have been fossilized, as well as plants as well. So again. Uh, they have disregarded that possibility whenever they've looked at it. With regard to marine animals, Graham et al. state, and this is uh, cited in the book again, beyond this, global atmospheric hyperoxia, and hyper is from the Greek preposition hooper, and uh, that's greater. Hyper, hyper is above, and hoopo, hoopo or, and uh, hypo or hoopo, is below. So this is greater oxygen level would have reduced the limitation of seasonal aquatic hypoxia. And so this right here, hyper is a hyperoxia is greater oxygen level. And the seasonal hypoxia, hypoxia. And so this is from a hypo or under. And so less oxygen. Now this occurs less oxygen in the water whenever it gets warm because the temperature of the water limits how much oxygen can be in the water. And you can put a pan of water on a, on a stove and, and start warming it up and you'll see bubbles coming out of it. And this is the uh, air that's in the water that uh, comes out of it. And uh, what, that, what we're seeing there, we're actually seeing the air come out. And this happens in the summertime. For instance, uh, we'll get fish dying because they don't have enough oxygen in the water. Uh, the biggest fish and the best fishing is uh, places where the water gets fairly cold. And, and uh, so there's more oxygen in the water for the fish to get larger and be more active. And that seems counterintuitive to us, but it's all linked into the fact that the colder the water, the more oxygen can, the water can hold. And so favorite interfaunal penetration and uh, faunal is animals in, in faunal. So that's penetration of marine sediments, allow denser aggregates and increased body size of some groups. So this is admitted by, by the ones we're citing here. This would be Graham and those uh, in the 1995 site. I have several sites of Graham, so you need to get to the one on uh, <clears throat> 1995. <clears throat> this point was discussed quite extensively back in chapter five. So I'll refer you back to those that discussion. We won't go into it any further. <clears throat> but we have an increase in uh, in the uh, amount of no, amount of fossils of marine uh, infaunal or faunal that's plant animals uh, penetration, so we'd have a greater amount of of uh, animals that would go deeper into the marine, marine sediments. Remember, uh, benthic organism B N T H I C benthic organ organisms uh, burrow down into the bottom of a lake or a of an ocean or a, a sea. 
and they go deeper. And if we have more oxygen in the water that comes in, they can dig deeper into it. So that means allow deeper aggregations and deeper penetration and lets them go deeper. Most of the fossils are marine plants and animals. Kind of keep that in mind. A large portion of them are. We should remember, here's something that we, we sometimes forget because we live in essentially a, a three-dimensional world, but we don't have a lot of animals above us. And I'm, I'm from, uh, I grew up on the prairie lands where there's almost no trees around. And we'd see a few animals flying up in the sky, birds and so forth, but no, almost nothing else above us. And so the number of animals was limited. We should remember that marine environments are essentially three-dimensional, essentially three-dimensional. Marine organisms can live in the sediment, on the bottom, near the bottom, and in all depths of the water. There's all kinds of organisms living in various depths of water. Keep that in mind, and so that's very important. We these uh, fellows that are objecting to it are projecting backwards. They're using uh, the uh, assumption that everything has continued as it was from the beginning, and they've uh, made that assumption about uniformitarianism. So their arguments are based on uniformitarian assumptions. That is, that the number of marine organisms that we presently see in the, in a square, a cubic meter of water, ocean water, is the same as it was back then. That's a, that's a false assumption. Density of organisms of the interleaving ocean was surely greater than post diluvian oceans. Let me point out, post diluvian density, that's density in our time, is quite high in some locations. For instance, in the La Jolla submarine canyon off the California coast, recent studies of the canyon revealed that it, it to be the most densely populated place ever described in the scientific literature. More than three million individual animals per square meter. Now that's that's a bunch per square meter. Now what we find here is that if this La Jolla Canyon is the most densely populated that they've ever found, if you project that, maybe even increase that greatly all over the world uh, in the in the conditions that we had antediluvian conditions, uh, we'd see a large number of fossils. And again, they have used and made assumptions that are uniformitarian in their assumptions. I told you that we just we keep coming back to this. Their, their assumptions are based on uniformitarianism. They're assuming that what they see out in a, in a cubic meter of water, ocean water right now, number of organisms is what they saw back then in the days of Noah. And that's just not true. If three million individual animals could live in one square meter of post diluvian ocean, then many times more than that could have lived in one square meter of the antediluvian oceans. And what we have here, the La Jolla Canyon is just a place that has a lot of fertility. What happens is uh, material comes out through the streams and feeds the, that canyon, and there's a lot of organisms living there. But in the post, in the antediluvian world, the whole ocean was like that. And that's, that's completely different than what we have now. Again, their assumptions are certainly false. The tallest trees in the world are over 300 feet, over 300 feet, 100 meters. Now, uh, a meter is just about 39.37 inches and 36 inches in a, in, a, in a yard or 12 inches in a foot. So what we have here is that's about 100 meters. The tallest trees are over 300 feet and they're like 330, 340 feet high right now in the world. And that's oh, that's over 100 meters in height. That's a pretty tall tree. We have some of these trees in the United States that are quite tall. In antediluvian times, forests existed in the Arctic region. We've already seen this in our prior studies. They were over 90 feet tall in the Arctic regions. Well, how big were they in the in the temperate and uh, and near the equator? We don't know. 
if extensive forests with very large trees exist in the interliving world, they would support larger numbers of animals per unit of area in the post diluvian world. Why? Well, and the trees are larger. And what we find is uh, the atmosphere was conducive to growth, and longevity and health. The soil was fertile. All of this together made large numbers of these animals per unit of area. Animals tend to live underground in burrows. Some animals do, and, then, and there are animals in all levels of the forest, which explains why dense forests have large numbers of animals, because they're three-dimensional, like the ocean. Now, of course, they go up three or 400 feet if they did in the interleaving world, four, 400, 500 feet tall trees. We'd still have a large number, but we won't have anything like the ocean, which goes down to thousands of feet deep, and they could support life all the way to the bottom. And so we have a lot more that could be found in the oceans, as well as in the in the forest as well. We're at, and the next question we ask is, were antediluvian men a bunch of ignorant savages? Well, it's evident that they were sinful, that's clear, from which could include savagery, Genesis 6, 5 and Genesis 6, 12 through 13. Let's read those passages when the Lord or Jehovah Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, we see they were evil, that's certainly true. And their, their hearts were just thinking of evil things. Now that certainly could have in, uh, been violence against other people, killing other people and harming other people. So that's certainly possible. They may have been savages. And, and get down to verse 12 of Genesis 6. And God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So here we see they were they were certainly evil. We don't know for sure that they, uh, how savage they were, much of a savage they were, but they were evil and that probably could have included savagery. But we have no evidence that they were ignorant. Now, I'm going to prove that here. And so we have ignorant savages. It may have been savages, but they weren't certainly ignorant. We have evidence of this in Genesis 4, uh, 420, not 520. And Adah bear Jabo, Jabo, he was the father of such as dwell in tents and have cattle. So here he's the father of those that dwell in tents and have cattle. So he, that is, Adah and Jabal, Jabal uh, he's the father of them dwell in tents and have cattle. So we domesticated animals. Uh, they not only domesticated animals, but they invented musical instruments. Genesis, uh, and this is 421, I'm sorry. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handled the harp and pipe. So here, there's Jubal. And so now we have instruments of music, harp and pipe, various instruments to make sounds of music sounds. Right? So now we have them domesticating animals. We have them inventing musical instruments. And I think the next slide is going to have chapter five in it wrong. Learned how to process metals in Genesis 5.22. So metallurgy came into bear. And Zella also buried Tubal Cain, the forger of every cutting instrument of brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. So here again, we have a, a metallurgy, uh, them dealing with metals and forging metals and cutting instruments. If Andy living mankind lived over 900 years, and we have evidence that they lived great lengths of time, they must have been quite vigorous. And this healthy body certainly would be conducive to a healthy mind as well. They tend to go together. A, a healthy body is uh, is helpful to having a healthy or a smart mind. In all likelihood, an individual man was quite intelligent. So we we assume that they were very intelligent, 
and we see them doing all kinds of things. It's possible that they were even advanced, quite advanced technologically, and they may have had some technological advances that we don't know about yet. How, how, now the next question here is, how could the ark be loaded with Noah, his family, and all the animals in one day? That's the answer to one of the arguments that's made by various people. I went to websites and found a series of websites that that uh, supposedly prove that the flood did not occur. So I've been, I want to go through and just add these to the book and answer them. And uh, many of them have logical fallacies as we'll lay out here. Uh, first of all, they're assuming uh, something that's not a fact, that is, that the ark was loaded in one day. Keel and Delitz is the scholarly commentary on the Pentateuch, uh, well, actually on the whole Old Testament, but on the Pentateuch, the one in on the Genesis state, verse 13, referring here, Genesis 6, 13, in the self same day that Noah entered into the ark, and they say it's pluperfect. And pluperfect is uh, something that was true, and uh, the perfect is was true and still is true. And so it was being true in the past, and the pluperfect is. And so it's really a past perfect tense is what it really is. Had come, not came, which would require. So he's saying, he's explaining the Hebrew here. The idea is not that Noah with his family and all the animals in the ark on the very day of which the rain began, but that on that day he was entering, he had in, he had entered, had completed the in entering. So your pluperfect is something that was completed, that's past perfect, something that was completed in the past tense. And that's what this is. And so it, he had completed entering, which occupied the seven days between the giving of the command and the commencement of the flood. So the command of verse four to enter the ark and then the flood is going to come. There's seven days period. And so we don't have one day. We have seven days that the animals could have entered the entered the ark. The animals were sent there by God. No doubt he controlled them and sent the ones he wanted. And so Noah wasn't having to round them up. So that's keep that in mind. They were sent to Noah. We've already established that in prior lessons. Atheists have asked a number of questions regarding the ark and how Noah managed the ark during the year of the flood. So they've asked them one question. One question is, uh, how did parasites survive during the flood without killing their host? Well, first of all, let me point out that all parasites don't kill their host. Sometimes they weaken them, make them sick, make them ill but they don't necessarily always kill them. If a parasite kills its host, then it has nothing to live on and it'll die. So parasites don't tend to kill their host uh, most of the time. Sometimes they do, uh, but uh, it's, they, uh, they have a problem. If they, if they kill their host right quickly, they don't have anything to feed on. One questions, one of the questions, uh, is how did parasites survive during the flood without killing their host? Well, we get into the problem here and we ask the question, how did they survive? Parasites go through many of the, many of your parasites go through various stages and they, uh, they go through uh, situations where they go from one, one animal to another or many of your parasites, such as liver flukes and others, uh, they will go into water and survive, and then they're drank or they're eaten. Uh, they uh, they wind up in the in the animal that they're infecting, and so a number of your your parasites actually uh, go through one from one host to another. Uh, malaria is caused by a parasite. And of course, the the uh, parasite is picked up, and by the mosquito, and then it is it goes into uh, people that are eaten, and 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 as well as uh, into animals as well. And so, the problem with this is 
that they made a an assumption. They made an assumption that if we can't explain how they survived, then uh, we uh, there's no explanation. And that's of course a false assumption. And we'll get into this a little bit later with an illustration of this. But this is one of the arguments, parasites. But now let's look further. Another question is, how can a 450 foot boat that was uh, 300 cubits. The, a cubit is about one and a half feet from the elbow to the end of the end of the middle finger, about 18 inches for most men. Uh, how can a 450 feet, uh, 137 meters long wooden boat float since modern ship engineers have not been able to build one longer than about 300 feet? So they have problems if it gets longer than about 300 feet. Now, let me point out, these atheists have made assumptions and based upon their incorrect assumptions, then they make this argument. And uh, if we go back to the to the parasites, we can go back and say we have shown and with documentation in, the, in our earlier studies that the hyperbaric conditions, hyperbaric chambers help the body to fight off parasites. Parasites have less, uh, they're less active and they have more trouble and the body is able to fight them off better uh, than under hyperbaric conditions. So what we have is the pre-flood conditions with the fertility of the food and the soil and the atmosphere being different would help them to fight off these parasites. And many of these parasites uh, come out of water. And so they could have survived the flood and it came out. I think many of what we see as parasites uh, have had small effects upon animals before the flood and, and humans, but the effects greatly increased because the, the body is not able to fight them off because of poor nutrition and because of the, the loss of hyperbaric conditions. Now, let's go back to the, our arc and the size of it. These atheists have assumed that the God who created the whole universe is unable to provide means to accomplish his will. So they've assumed that that uh, that uh, they know everything about shipbuilding and that God wasn't able to build a ship and wasn't able to come up with one that would work or float. Their whole line of argumentation begs the question that God doesn't exist. But let's look further. They assume that modern in shipbuilding engineers Marine engineers have tested every possible mechanism for shipbuilding with wooden materials. And also they've assumed that modern wood is the same as the antediluvian wood. They've made those two assumptions. They've also made an assumption because about the shape of the ark. I doubt that they've tested the, uh, the materials uh, that they would have found in the post-diluvian or antediluvian world. And uh, they certainly hadn't had that kind of wood. And also the another problem that they run into is that they don't have uh, the shape. The ships that they tested have been streamlined and the ark was not streamlined. It was most, mostly a barge. It was just for floating. It wasn't for sailing. Did these engineers, another question, to the test ship with the shape and dimensions of the ark? That's the question. They're guilty of the logical fallacy of denying the antecedent in this whole line of argumentation. So here's the argument. Now, this question and the documentation upon it and the arguments that I'm looking at here are discussed extensively in Appendix C. But we'll lay it out here. In Appendix C, shipbuilders objected to ships over 300 feet long for two reasons. Trees do not grow longer than 300 feet in the length, and this limited the length of the ship timbers. All right. Now, if in the antediluvian world, trees got to be 450 feet tall due to the increased barometric pressure and, and uh, other conditions, and I don't believe there are any large winds to topple trees before the flood. I think the evidence is clear. And so 
if they got longer than this 300 feet length, would certainly be thrown away, it would be lost. We wouldn't have that length uh, problem. The problem is solved at the end of the living trees grew taller than 300 feet. That could be solved pretty easily. The hulls of the ship had to be curved to streamline the ship. Now a ship has to be streamlined in order to move through the water. But the arc wasn't streamlined. The problem is solved if the arc was not streamlined. Now, what's the problem when they when they bend the ship timbers on the wooden ships? Uh, it creates problems for the wood, and so they have to put it into a, a situation to to actually curve it or actually get a tree that's already bent, and that's real hard to do. And you can't get long ones, and that's uh, for the hull of your ship. It's the hull of the ship has to be curved to streamline it. And so that creates problems because when the ship flexes as it goes through water, it goes through waves and it goes up and down on the waves, and that moves the, the material and it'll tend to leak. But again, we don't have that problem with the with the arc uh, in the uh, in the fact that it wasn't a curved hull. This argument, here's the argument, here's the logical form of it. If Christians can answer question X, then question X has an answer. Well, that's certainly true. Right? Christians cannot answer question X. Therefore, question X does not have an answer. Well, that's not true. That would only be true if God couldn't answer it. Because Christians don't know everything there is to know. Now, I might not be very, very uh, trained, very well trained in shipbuilding, but uh, that fact that I don't know how to build ships doesn't mean that somebody else doesn't know how to build ships. I'm, I'm a, I was trained in electrical engineering and I've had some mechanical and uh, some uh, basically civil as well, but I have not been trained in marine engineering. I haven't had any schooling in that, any education in it. So the fact that I don't understand how to build a ship doesn't mean that there isn't a way to build it. <laughs> See how foolish that is? That's foolish. And again, it's a logical fallacy of denying the antecedent. He's made the following argument. All A or B, and the minor premise is, the theistic model is a model that fails to explain phenomenon X, right? Then the conclusion is, this is called an enthymeme, the major premise is not stated. Now your basic form of it is major premise, all A or B, C is A, C is B, of this basic uh, syllogistic argument. And so the A term is given, C is A, all A or B, C is A, uh, C is B, and so your C term is uh, the C is A, the theistic model, all right? And, uh, and then B, C is B, all A or B, C is A, C is B, and so your B term is the model that's unsound. So we can, with the minor and the premise and the conclusion, we can reproduce the major premise they had to use logically. Categorical syllogism then is an enthymeme with the major premise omitted. The major premise demanded by the minor premise and conclusion is all models that fail to explain phenomenon X are models that are unsound. Well, that's their claim. The argument proves the atheistic, the, the atheist is irrational in this. He, he is right, irrational. All models which fail to explain phenomenon X are models that are unsound. Um, the theistic model is a model that fails to explain phenomena X. There are phenomena that uh, that the uh, atheist cannot explain. And so if that means that his atheistic premise is false, then if it if it works for the for the theistic premise, then it works for the atheistic premise as well. So all models which fail to explain phenomena X are models that are unsound. The atheistic model is a model that's supposed to explain phenomena. The atheistic model is a model that's unsound, so atheism is unsound. Again, uh, what proves too much proves nothing. 
And our, their problem is this can be used as a two-edged sword upon them, this basic line of reasoning. The atheist has committed the logical fallacy of special pleading. What, what he's doing is treat me special. That's the way I remember that, what it means. So the atheist has not set forth a theory that explains all of the facts, as evidenced by the facts that atheists disagree among themselves. They can't agree on various things. And so that means that, that uh, they haven't arrived at a consensus. Even if they had a consensus, that doesn't mean they're right. But what we have here is the fact that they don't agree shows that they can't explain all the facts. Now, as evidenced by the fact that atheists disagree amongst them, yet they, he basically argues that the failure of the theistic model to explain all the facts proves that no sound theistic model can be constructed. And I would argue then if that's true, then the, the basic fact that the the atheistic model that can't explain all the facts proves that no sound atheistic model can be constructed. Just put the word atheistic in there and just put the A on the front of it. And uh, what you'll have here, basically arguments failure of the atheistic model can to explain all the facts, proves that no sound atheistic model can be constructed. See, this argument can be turned upon them. And there, I have never run into an atheist that was rational. It made good logical arguments that would stand up. And if you if you use sound reasoning, I just never have seen them. And here he's special pleading. Treat me special. It's called special pleading. Treat me special. Don't treat me by the same standard I want you to follow. I know. I want to buy my reasoning to you, but don't you use that same reasoning on me. That's special pleading. This demonstrates that some atheists are either irrational or dishonest, or perhaps both, both irrational and dishonest. Here's another one. The atheist Robert J. Shalowald wrote a treatise supposedly disproving the fact that the flood of Genesis 6 through 9 occurred. Now, he wrote this treatise, and you can find it on the internet. And uh, I'll, I'll give you the link to it in just a minute. Here's your link. And it's six flood arguments. We'll, we'll answer some of them here. And I'm, going, I'm proposing to answer the whole series of arguments that have been made by these people. Most of them have logical fallacies in them, as we've already pointed out. Here's his argument. Humankind is the only known reservoir for numerous communicable diseases. That is, the germs or viruses which cause these diseases can survive only in living human bodies or well-equipped laboratories. So now here's, he's given something up here. A well-equipped laboratory can, can keep these as well. So these can survive outside the human body in certain conditions. So we need to kind of keep that in mind here. That's in the background. He's already admitted that in his premise. Keep that in mind. Well-known examples include measles, pneumococcal pneumonia, leprosy, typhus, typhoid fever, smallpox, polio, and what we used to call polio, and syphilis and gonorrhea. So these are ones that only uh, can survive in human bodies or well-equipped laboratories. That is, there are conditions they can survive outside the body. But he's already given away his whole premise. His whole argument gave it away with that with that statement. Or well-equipped laboratories, he gave it away. Gave away his argument. But look further. He's guilty of the logical fallacy of denying the antecedent. So his argument denies the antecedent. Here is his implicit argument. First premise. If a creationist can explain how diseases that are only found in humans could be, have, be have, have gone on the ark without wiping out Noah and his family, then there's the explanation of how this could have occurred. Well, that is a true statement. If I can explain it, then there is an explanation. Okay, that's obvious. But then he turns around and says a creationist cannot explain. Well, my failure to explain something doesn't mean it doesn't occur. Now, I know I know that I knew this when I was a boy. I knew that 
diesel engines worked. But when I remember when I was a boy, uh, six, eight, ten years old, I'd look at those diesel engines and hear them running, and I'd say, where are the spark plugs? <laughs> okay. And of course, they fire under great pressure. One of you increase the pressure in the combustion chamber, the temperature goes up. Simple rule of physics. Well, I learned that when I studied physics. And I could see how it would uh, co cause combustion. And, but I didn't have a spark plug. And so uh, that kind of kind of made me wonder, how does this thing work? And uh, so again, my failure to explain it and, and even understand it didn't prove it didn't work. Didn't prove there wasn't a way to explain it. Just meant that I was ignorant. I just didn't know. Now, it, being ignorant and being stupid don't always mean the same thing. A stupid person is probably ignorant, but a, a, you can be ignorant and be very intelligent, be ignorant of all kinds of stuff. There's a lot of stuff I just don't know. I don't know how to speak Chinese, for example. I'm ignorant of speaking Chinese. Let's go back now. Let me go back to this. I know I got off on that a little bit. If a creationist can explain how these diseases were, that are only found in human bodies could have gone on the ark, now notice we've left out under laboratory conditions, could have gone on the ark without wiping out Noah and his family, then there's an explanation of how this could have occurred. A creationist cannot explain how diseases that were only found in humans could have gone on the ark without wiping out Noah and his family. Therefore, there is no explanation of how this could have occurred. Well, first of all, he, he gave us an explanation of the possibility and in well-equipped laboratories, it can survive that is, it can survive in, under conditions that are not in the human body. He's already admitted that. He already gave away his whole argument right here with that. Of course, he's denying the antecedent here, and this is a logical fallacy. You don't go say, deny the antecedent, and that doesn't prove anything, right? And so we need to get into the study of logic. And the problem is our, the Western world has not studied logic and they don't know how to reason. This is, of course, the shame of these uh, atheists that they haven't studied how to reason first. And they're, they're arguing that there's no God. But he denies the unseen, which is a, a gross logical fallacy. It's a sophomoric argument, basically. His argument proves nothing. The hyperbaric condition of the interleuvian world probably prevented these diseases from harming humans as they do now. And so we can see this occurring. Hyperbaric conditions may have allowed these diseases to exist outside the human body in other places. It's possible that some of these diseases are from sinful activities, such as having sexual animals with animals, sexual relations with animals. And I heard from some pretty reliable sources that some of the AIDS that uh, spread through the world uh, came as a result of people having sex relations with uh, with animals. If that's true, then this could have this could have uh, caused it and brought it, released it upon the world. But again, we've already stated here that antediluvian man was healthier. He had uh, better nutrition. He had hyperbaric conditions. And the situation was completely different than we have now. Some of these diseases might have come from eating certain animals without properly cooking them. So you eat an animal without cooking it. You eat raw, raw food. Sometimes I get so, it just bothers me that some people will eat raw clams. And they can get all kinds of diseases from that. And it bothers me, and I just don't understand why people do that. I don't understand why people eat raw fish. There's all kinds of diseases you can get from raw, from raw fish, from any kind of meat. Uh, you need to cook it and cook it well. Genetic mutations caused by the loss of water river canopy might have caused some of these organisms to become mutated and begin to harm humans. So it might have been mutations that caused them to do it. These animals, these organisms may have been first perfectly beneficial or benign before they were mutated. And so we see there's all kinds of possibilities. He's already admitted they could survive outside the human body under certain laboratory conditions. 
if the conditions were right, he right, he admitted it. Loss of the hyperbaric conditions might have caused some of these organisms to become harmful to humans when they have not been harmful under hyperbaric conditions. Now remember, we studied this, and animals or organisms uh, such as yeast. No, it's not an animal. Yeast is not, but uh, yeast, for example, goes through the pasture point uh, whenever it has hypo, it has lost, loses all the oxygen. So the yeast begins to assimilate its food, in this case, glucose or sugar. It assimilates it by by a different means, and it gives off, of course, poison. It gives off alcohol as a as a byproduct of this process. So it shifts gears and changes how it actually it's it's aerobic as long as it has oxygen. It becomes anaerobic whenever it loses and the oxygen is gone, but it still can grow. But it, it does it differently, and it gives a byproduct, and that byproduct is alcohol, which is poison. And so these organisms could easily, in pre-flood conditions, not harm man at all. But they begin to harm man after the flood as they spread. Again, he's already admitted they could have survived outside the human body. They go through the pasture pond and begin to produce toxins. And that's exactly what we see here. Whenever, whenever uh, grape juice runs out of oxygen, it begins to produce alcohol. And so it produces something different before it runs out of oxygen. If it's vinegar. There might be other explanations for these diseases that I just don't, I'm not smart enough to figure out. But the fact that I don't know it doesn't mean that there's not someone that knows it or that there's something that's not known to anybody yet that could explain it. Again, the atheist is irrational. And that's what we see here. Irrational thinking on the part of our atheist friends.